like that. On the final Saturday in September, the Minot State University Beavers look to keep their unbeaten home record alive against the University of Sioux Falls Cougars who go from the den to the dam on their longest road trip of the season. But before things get kicked off up at Herb Parker Stadium, it's time for the official pregame show of the Minot State Beavers football team, the Saturday Showdown brought to you by Popeyes. From the KMSU Hartnett Hall Studios, alongside Dalton Davis and Gage Eastlick, who will join me shortly, I'm Owen Patterson, joined first by the head coach of the Minot State Beavers, Ian Shields. Thank you for joining us this morning on a fabulous Saturday, September uh, afternoon. Appreciate it, Owen. Now excited to be here, and uh, we're excited to play today, get back home here in the Magic City and uh, Energy Day, so let's get ready to roll. Yeah, let's talk about playing at home. You guys are 2-0 and here. It seems to be a reinvigorated fan base behind you guys here at the Herb. What's it like playing in front of that crowd? Well, it's great. Uh, we expect a big crowd today, too, and I think the first 1,000 people get free T-shirts, so that, that's always a nice incentive. Um, but it, it's special playing at home. We think we're, we have a tremendous home field advantage. We're the furthest north and the furthest west in this league. It's a long trip for everybody that comes here, um, and we want to welcome them properly. So we should be ready to go. As Obviously, this is our first uh, Saturday showdown of the year. First instance getting to talk to you here on the show. But the season's already almost halfway over. We're already there, really getting into the grind of the NSIC schedule. And you guys have gotten off to a somewhat historic start at the Division II level, a 3 and one campaign. Just fill in the fans on what's been going down in the first five weeks and how you guys are feeling. Yeah, I mean, it started back in the offseason and then went through training camp. And um, We've got a lot of goals accomplished to this point. You know, we, we've bonded our team. I think we had a tighter, better culture. I think that's the starting point. We have some really good leadership that's helped make that happen with our senior class. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, some key recruits have showed up as well. You know, to credit to our assistant coaches, done a great job uh, building that. So um, we've played relatively well. I think the biggest thing is we're playing hard. We played a tremendous effort. Uh, and we've done the little things well. We, we're the least penalized team in the country right now. Uh, we've only turned the ball over three times all season, and I think we have 11, t 10 or 11 takeaways. So we're plus eight or nine on the turnover margin, uh, which that always gives you a chance. We're not the most talented team uh, in the country, uh, but we are playing hard, and we're doing the little things that can correlate to winning football. Yeah, that takeaway total nationally recognized uh, back in the Southwest Minnesota State game. And on the broadcast, I've spoken about it. You guys are a run first team. You run the flex phone. Uh, you can't afford to have turnovers. So what have you liked from the offense so far through the first four weeks? Well, I think, I think we've done a nice job as far as time possession, maintaining the ball, running the ball. Uh, we're the leading rushing offense in the, con in the conference, uh, not the country. Uh, we have ways to go to do that. Yeah. Uh, but we're gaining on it. We're, we're, we're doing well. We can play better. Uh, we can execute better. We need to get some more explosive plays. We've been kind of a ground, grinded out, ground and pound group. Um, but if you like the homecoming game against Northern, we took the ball and closed that game out and kicked the game winning field goal to win it. And that's good football and didn't leave them with a lot of time left on the clock to, to do anything on the back end of it. So, like I said, we're not really the most prolific offense yet, and time will get there. Um, but we can be efficient. And like I said, there are opportunities in the past game as well. We're not going to be an aerial circus by any stretch, but we do need to hit, um, you know, occasionally uh, play action ball for big hits. Going back to last Saturday, first loss of the season at Minnesota State, a top 10 national team, a powerhouse yeah. in Division Two, and the Northern Sun, a 40 to 6 loss. But there's got to be some positive takeaways from that one, things you learned against uh, a great Mavericks team. Yeah, you know, the. That's where the bar set in the Northern Sun Conference in, in Mankato. They, I think they won 10 of the last 14 conference championships. They've played for two national championships. Like they're, and I think this might be, you know, talking to their coaches, this might be his, be his best team he's had. So um, the quarterback played really well. He's probably a guy that's going to have a shot playing at the next level. They got, they, got an, uh, they got a couple outstanding receivers, one in particular that might have a chance to play uh, beyond Mankato. So. That's a talented, experienced team, um, both sides of the ball. And, and uh, well, we found out you know, where we stacked up against them, and it wasn't great. Um, but we're capable of playing better than we did. We can play harder than we played. Uh, we can make all kinds of excuses. Uh, the road trip on the other end of it, right, it was really hot. It was the first time we guys have ever played on grass here. Like, and so, there, I mean, but there's no excuses. It's a bottom line business. So we got to play better. We got to coach better. And I, I think we'll see uh, an improved effort here today. 
Yeah, moving into today's game against the University of Sioux Falls, another team that's 3-1. and one. This is a pretty big schedule you guys are facing here in September and October. Some really good Northern Sun teams. What's the game plan to get a crucial W here in the early part of conference play? Yeah, you know, Sioux Falls is an excellent team. You know, they're, they're playing really well. Uh, they beat St. Thomas to open the season, you know, FCS program and at St. Thomas, and they, and they beat them up pretty bad, to be candid. Um, and, and they're playing well. This is a good team. Uh, Coach Glow does a nice job there. They're, they're thick on defense. Um, they're formidable. And then I think offensively, they have a lot of trades, motion shifts. They, it's pretty complex what they're doing, kind of like the old Boise State teams uh, in, in football lore. Um, so they're a challenge. And the, and the quarterback is the straw that stirs the drink. Their quarterback's a really good player, uh, dual threat guy, and uh, he's a challenge. Uh, again, focusing on your team again here against Sioux Falls. Evan Lovett's been the number one running back all season long, but it was Sam Buchanan that led the team in rushing against Minnesota State. Talk about the strong running back core you guys have and their health coming into Week Five. Yeah, both those B backs have been been productive. You know, it was you know, Sam played well last week against Mankato. He was like one of a few of the bright spots. Sam Buchanan was a bright spot last week. Uh, Evan is a talented guy, arguably the most talented offender we have in our program. Um, you know, Carson Christman hasn't been quite full speed at quarterback, you know, dealing with uh, some health issues, but I, I think he's going to be close to full speed today, and I think that'll bode well for us offensively. So you're seeing some guys step up. Jonathan Noriega out at receiver has been an, a, a great addition for us. Uh, and then you got Stonebreaker, Palmquist, some steady guys, and we just need to get a few more explosives on the perimeter, and that's and a that's, uh, been lacking frankly we've been great between the tackles we just need to make so a few more things happen on the perimeter well it was a seven nothing game last season when minot state faced the university of sioux falls this time around minot state gets the cougars at home coach ian shields thank you for taking time out of your saturday morning i know it's pretty busy for college football coaches to do that but we appreciate your time and best of luck this afternoon that's it appreciate it. roll abuse all right, coming up next on the Saturday Showdown, we will hear from Gage Eastlick as he takes a look around the Northern Sun Intercollegiate Conference. Again, that's coming up next on the Saturday Showdown, brought to you by Popeyes. by Popeyes with the KMSU Hartnett Hall Studios. Dalton Davis, thank you for joining us here at the table uh, ahead of this Minot State game day. But first, before we get to our discussion here, we got to take a look at what's happening inside NSIC football. And for that, well, Gage Eastlick has, uh, has our news this week five. And that I do, Owen, pretty big stuff heading into week five. So let's get right into it. And the NSA, NSIC has been a battleground so far this season, currently ranked Number seven ranked Minnesota State Mankato is atop the standings going into week five with an overall record of four and one, four and oh, excuse me. And they look to keep their streak alive against Concordia St. Paul, who is one and two overall. The Maverick offense is controlled by senior quarterback Hayden Eckern. Eckern is rolling with a passer rating of 154 and eight passing touchdowns thus far. 
His number one target junior, Treshawn Watson, is second in the NSIC with six receiving touchdowns and 393 yards. The Mavericks look to keep their foot on the gas this week, relying heavily on this combo. Kickoff for that game is at 12 o'clock. And moving over to northern Minnesota, the Bemidji State Beavers are taking on the University of Mary Marauders. Bemidji is currently tied for third in the conference with an overall record of 3-1. They are coming off a big win against Sioux Falls, which saw them win 28-24. The Beavers threw for 263 yards and three touchdowns, as well as rushing for 154 yards with one touchdown. As for the University of Mary Marauders, they are on the opposite side of the spectrum. They are currently 1-3 and, and lost their last game against the Minnesota Duluth to a tune of 43-7. In that matchup, the Marauders only scored once on a fumble recovery for 36 yards by senior defensive back Jalen Martin. Kickoff between Bemidji State and University of Mary is at 2 o'clock. Now, last week for the Augustana Vikings, sophomore Gunnar Hensley dominated the Northern State Wolves, beating them 41-7. In that game, Hensley threw for the NSIC best 358 yards with four passing touchdowns. He also completed 28 of his 35 total passes on top of that. Hensley also caught a touchdown of his own with a four-yard pass from senior wide receiver Jack Fisher. For this performance, Gunnar Hensley was given a NSIC Offensive Player of the Week, an accolade he looks to double down on going into their matchup today against Minnesota State Moorhead. Kickoff is at noon. Now, this wouldn't be an NSIC update without talking about Minot State's very own Diego Nunez-Smith. Diego is a junior kicker out of Vacaville who played for Vanden High School and Contra Costa Community College before attending Minot State. He was also named Special Teams Player of the Week in Week 3 due to his performance in the homecoming game against Northern State. In that game, he was 3-for-3 three three on field goal attempts, the last of which would be the decider with 146 left on the clock to complete the comeback for Minot State, the final score being 17-14. So far this season, Diego is 4-for-4 four four on field goal attempts with 8-for-9 on extra point attempts, missing his first one last week against Minnesota State Mankato. He has been solid so far and looks to keep it that way going in today's matchup against Sioux Falls. So, Owen, what are you most excited for looking into week five of this NSIC season? Well, that Augustana Moorhead game looks really fun. You're just talking about Hensley. He can sling it. We know Moorhead can score points. They already have an upset this year on the road against Minnesota Duluth. That's a matchup I have circled today. But also ours, Minot State and Sioux Falls, uh, should be a nice contest. And we've got the keys to the game breaking it all down coming up next on the Saturday Showdown presented by Popeyes. <coughs> Welcome back to the Saturday Showdown presented by Popeyes. I'm joined here with Gage Eastlick and Owen Patterson. My name is Dalton Davis. Owen, we're getting into the top three keys of this game today versus USF. What do you th see today as uh, we take them on at the Herb? Well, everybody knows that Minot State wants to run the football, so it's about rush defense for the University of Sioux Falls. They allow just 106 rushing yards per game, which is a really nice set against the Minot State team, which you heard Coach Shields leads the conference in rushing. But Minot State's rush defense, they have to be good as well. Sioux Falls can uh, tote the football for quite a few yards, and Minot State 
They allow the most yards per attempt in the NSIC at over five yards per carry. Rush defense for me is number one. Absolutely. And, you know, the last time these teams played, Sioux Falls did end up winning 7 to nothing. A very tight game. Not a whole lot of competition going into it. Just hard defense the entire time. Not a whole lot of offense. So, as you said, Owen, rushing is going to be a big part of this game. And I think giving the ball over to uh, Lovett at running back will be the best bet for this Minot State offense. Moving into the pace of play. Sioux Falls, when they score early, they're going to win football games. Since 2022, 12-5 as a team when leading at the half. Lately, though, that hasn't been too much of the case. They led Bemidji State last week 17-14 at the break and ended up falling to the Beavers uh, last Saturday. As for this Beavers team they're facing today, they're second in the NSIC in time of possession. They possess the football for 32 minutes of each football game. If Minot State can make this a low-scoring game like you just mentioned a year ago, 7 nothing. I think this time around they could turn it in their favor. I think they definitely can, especially since uh, Sioux Falls doesn't have a great passing offense. Ranked ninth in passer rating for their team with only 800, 183 yards per game on average. And MSU has a sixth best passer defense in the NSIC as well, 173 yards. So a lot to look forward to there with this, game, uh, this matchup. Yeah, Sioux Falls starting quarterback Cameron Dean, he kind of came in at the end of last year in a quarterback change. And he's looked good at times, but what's been plaguing Sioux Falls here for the last two years, too many interceptions. And you heard in our conversation with Coach Shields, one of the best takeaway teams in the, uh, the league and in even all of Division Two is right here in Minot, North Dakota. They're going to pose quite the threat to Dean and the Sioux Falls passing attack. Absolutely. And another key point, I know you did, I'm going to add to it a little bit here if that's all right, but dominate the line of scrimmage. Now, Minot State has only been sacked two times all year while they've been on offense, but have been delivering a little bit more on defense with five sacks of their own. But for Sioux Falls, they've only given up four sacks as well, but have eight of their own. So it's going to be a little bit of a competition at the line of scrimmage today here for Minot State and Sioux Falls. You also heard from Coach, he was mentioning how there's only – They've only turned the ball over three times. So getting the ball on defense and then not giving it back on offense is also going to be key today, too. Absolutely. I think going away from numbers, just have a must-win attitude as well. We've talked uh, and said this is a tough part of the schedule uh, right now in the NSIC. Minot State, after this game against 3-1 and one Sioux Falls, they'll take on Wayne State on the road, a team that's above 500, home against Augustana, currently unbeaten and in the top 25, and then at Bemidji State. Uh, this is a must-win game, it feels like, for MSU. Absolutely, and MSU just needs to come out firing on all cylinders right away. There's no time to wait, especially with how last year was. I mean, 7 nothing, really tight game the whole way through. I think one thing I noticed from that game, and uh, at least a lot of some of the games this year, especially at the last homecoming game, our ability to be able to get it in the end zone right now. Um, last week, or at homecoming, we had three field goals, right? Last year, we had uh, I know we had one, uh, a couple red zone appearances, and we weren't able to score it, um, losing 7 to nothing. So I think that a key is going to be punching that into the end zone and getting, you know, seven points instead of three is huge as far as, you know, chunking away, making that score higher because we know that uh, USF is going to put it in the end zone. They're going to score points and we got to keep up with them. Why not State trying to beat Sioux Falls for the first time since 1994. That was in an NAIA playoff game, 10 game losing streak against the Cougars. And also backtracking back to the defensive side of the ball for the Beavers, Nalu Cordero was player of the week on defense three weeks ago, I believe, against SMSU. Now, he's been, he's a freshman, but he's been a big impact for this team so far. I mean, two interceptions, two pick sixes. Come on. I think that, yeah, he's been, he's new this year. We got a lot of new guys, but I think what coach was harping on too is the captains, you know, um, Emin Espino and, uh, why can't Mizell Williams, like both of them leading the charge on each side of the, the offense and the defense. I think the vibe is different in the locker room. I think that there's a lot of energy coming to this year, starting off three and oh, they're excited. You can see it. I know last year it was like by the end of the year, they were defeated. It seemed like every time I was talking to the football players, they were down and it was just a rough season for them. But this year they come out, they're fired up, they're, they're hot. And I know that that momentum can lead them to more success throughout the season. And that's going to be huge today against USF. And speaking of Emmett Espino, last year they, when these two teams played off uh, here at home, I believe, Emmett Espino had seven total tackles, three of which were for losses, and two sacks. So if he's going to play like that, he, how he did last year, it might look pretty good for the defense. Here. I think it might look a little different. They did, over the offseason, they did transfer Emmett from the defensive line to the offensive line. That's right. He's I an offensive that. guard now. So 
they won't have him on the defensive line, but hopefully he's able to make a, an impact with the running game, and uh, we'll see if that pays off today. Well, guys, do we have any more keys? I think that we've touched on that Minot State game really well. We're going to move on to some other college football matchups today, looking at the uh, FBS. FBS, we've got number 20, Oklahoma State, versus number 23, Kansas State. Minnesota versus number 12, Michigan. Uh, number 15, Louisville, Louisville versus number 16, Notre Dame. And then the key game for today, number two, Georgia versus number four, Alabama. Georgia coming off a 13 to 12 win versus unranked Kentucky. Did you, were you able to catch that game, Owen? I, I did. Kentucky, they had chances, but Georgia got out of there with a win. Uh, Alabama also, I mean, they played a close game against South Florida till the fourth quarter, so they've all looked a little bit rough, but obviously they're going to bring it uh, today in that top four matchup in the SEC. Yeah, and I think that's a make or break game for kind of both of those teams. Georgia coming up against Kentucky, barely taking the win out, and then Alabama, new head coach, you don't know what to expect. It's still early in the year. Anything could happen at this point. Yeah, I think that today, you know, Georgia coming off that loss, one, that they were ranked number, or I guess they coming off the win, I apologize, but it was, it almost felt like a loss because you're facing unranked Kentucky. You go into it expecting to win, right? Expecting to win by a lot. And if you're number one and you're facing unranked, you need to win by a lot. And because they only won by one point, that dropped them down. And now Texas is number one, right? But Texas just lost their quarterback, Ken Quinn Ewers. Archie Manning comes in. How do we think that's going to unfold as far as what? the top four is going to look like. Uh, looks to be no problem there in Austin. <laughs> and whatever quarterback is playing, they seem to be in good hands right now. Yeah, uh, I know that Archie, he had a good game last week. He's starting again this week. I don't know when, what the timeline for Quinn Ewers coming back is, but having two of the top quarterbacks in college football on your team is never a bad thing. I don't think Texas has much to worry about as far as having Archie at quarterback. He's got the He's got the pizzazz, he's got the uh, name to him, and uh, we'll see how he fares out for the rest of the year. Um, moving on to FCS matchups as far as local, um, UND goes against uh, Murray State today as well as NDSU versus Illinois. But some local sports is what we're going to move to because we have some big games that we're coming off of as far as in the Minot area. Bishop Ryan, 5-0, and coming, uh, facing Surrey last night, 0-5. They, uh, they won 75 to nothing off of uh, QB Jet Lundin. Three passing touchdowns, a rushing touchdown. They just took it to him, and they didn't let off gas, did they? Yeah, pretty crazy game. Lundin, three passing touchdowns, as you just said. I mean, I think there's more in the tank there. He could have definitely had more if he wanted. But wide receiver Hayden C.A., C.A., two receiving touchdowns that night. Crazy game. I mean, Surrey's been struggling all year. I mean, 0-5. Hasn't really been able to get anything going on offense or defense. But Bishop Ryan, man, came out swinging. And Clayton Hawking, or our very own, is a coach for that team, actually. Former Minot State football player. Moved to uh, coach for Bishop Ryan. Yeah, Bishop Ryan, next week they got a big game against number two in the state in single A, Velva Drake, Anna Moose Garrison. All they had to do is take care of business against Surrey. Don't let that game get away. And uh, judging by that box score, they surely took care of business. Yeah, they got a big matchup next week, 5-0 versus Siri. I know I talked to Clayton before, and he's going he's gonna to lock in his players for next week because that's going to be really the first challenge of the, of the year for them. Um, but also coming off last night was a, a Minot High versus Bismarck High matchup. Owen, you called that game last night. What did you come by from that game? Uh, well, it was one of the wilder football games I've ever seen. Two special teams touchdowns got the job done there for Minot High. Uh, Bismarck returned a punt for a touchdown in the first half. Minot blocked a punt, scored a touchdown on that to, to go ahead late in the game. Bismarck had an 80-yard touchdown out of nowhere. Uh, it was just uh, your typical 3A football game in North Dakota. A lot about the defense, a lot about the offensive line. Now, Bismarck was without their University of Washington commit uh, on the offensive line, Jack Schaefer. So that was kind of a shuffling move for Bismarck High on the O-line. But uh, Minot High comes away with the win, taking down undefeated number one Bismarck Demons. Four special teams touchdowns. Two. Two, okay. So four. Two touchdowns on the special teams. That's that's a pretty crazy game right there. And there was a crazy game up on North Hill as well. Double overtime. Minot North falls to St. Mary's, 42 to 41. It wasn't a bad game to choose from in Minot last night. No, I don't. I think that there's a lot of action last night. I think that there. I mean, there's only one game that really wasn't close. But uh, as far as uh, the Minot area, we're going two for three on wins. So I'd call it a successful night. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of action, not just with Minot State football, but with the local sports as well. A lot of exciting news as far as the first season with Minot North and how they're playing out. And then, um, yeah, if you guys haven't checked out Minot North Stadium, I know that it's brand new and they're looking 
hot. It's brand new high school, brand new everything up there. And uh, if you're in the Minot area, go check out one of their games. I know that if you're a, a Minot High family or fan, you're probably going to check out one of their games at Minot North. Um, with that being said, we're going to move away from local sports and uh, head on off to the last football league that we haven't discussed yet, um, the NFL. So far that we've got some a lot of hot topics this NFL season has just been uh, just not the NFL. Uh, Steelers are 3-0. and Seahawks are 3-0. and The Vikings are 3-0. and We got Sam Darnold-led Vikings, right? 3-0. Uh, and I don't think anybody expected that with wins over the Giants, 49ers, and Texans. What do you guys make of that? I don't know how the Vikings are 3-0, and and if I'm being completely honest. Sam Darnold came off being a backup for, I believe, two or three years now. I mean, hasn't seen the field very much. With the 49ers, he got a little bit in for here and there when they were having big leads, but I just I kind of find it harder to believe that the Vikings are 3-0. and Maybe the Steelers, Justin Fields coming into Pittsburgh, they're 3-0 and as well. Obviously, there's still, what, 15 more weeks of the season. A lot to be decided. The Bengals could come out of nowhere once again. A winless start for them. Uh, but, yeah, quite the first couple weeks there in the National Football League. Yeah, I know that the, the teams that we've expected to do well as far as the Bengals, I know the Ravens have had a couple tough first weeks, and those teams not doing so well, and then the Steelers, Seahawks, Vikings. I know that the Steelers haven't played – too many, I guess, proven teams yet. They went with the Falcons and then the Broncos. And then last week with the win, who did they play last Los week? Los Angeles Chargers. The Chargers, yeah. None of those teams were really on too hot of a table right now. I mean, most of them uh, you know, got early new quarterbacks. I know that Herbert went down in the Steelers game, and or in the Chargers game, I apologize. But the thing with the Vikings that I, I kind of take it back to is the Vikings are 3-0. and They won versus the Giants. Okay, expect it. Giants, not very good. But then the 49ers, that was a close game that they took to them. They won by a possession. I believe that final score was 23-17. to But then following that, I'm like, okay, maybe they, they got something there. But then the Texans, right? Texans are a proven playoff team last year, won the NFC South, or a AFC South. And they go in, beat them 34-9. C.J. Stroud... Uh, then he looked lost out there. Sam Darnold, look, he's been playing well, and he deserves a lot of the credit, but their defense deserves a lot of the credit too. I think that going into the season, he was just supposed to be a comp quarterback competition with J.J. McCarthy. J.J. McCarthy goes down. He's now the starter, solidified, and he's taken advantage of it. I know that he was a second overall pick with the Jets. Doesn't work out there. Goes over to Carolina. Doesn't work out there, and finally – you know, has a little backup time with San Francisco, gets some time under Kyle Shanahan, heads over to Kevin O'Connell and the Vikings, and he's found success there. I think that there's just been a line of those quarterbacks, kind of, with Baker Mayfield as well. I think as far as the atmosphere that these quarterbacks need to be able to play at is important. Kevin O'Connell, a brand-new head coach, he's made him, shaped him up, and I think we could see a new resurgence as far as, like, backup quarterbacks that could be doing well. I look at, like, Bryce Young. Bryce Young just got benched. What's the atmosphere in Carolina? They haven't had a successful quarterback in since Cam Newton, right? So they're looking for they're looking for new guys. I expect to see a bunch of new quarterbacks or lost quarterbacks come back up like Sam Darnold. The Vikings a three zero start, and uh, that's kind of the headline of the NFL right now. That's sports for today. We got we've covered every football league right now, and we were able to talk for what fifteen minutes there, and we were able to get to the end of the show. So great job, guys. Uh, I'm joined here, Owen Patterson, Gage e. Slick. This is the Saturday Show, and I'm presented by Popeyes. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure to go to the Herb at 1 p.m. That's when kickoff starts, and if you're not there, then check out the stream. Owen's going to be on the mic as well as Howard Wade. And, uh, yeah, we will see you guys next time on Saturday Showdown.